Hello watch lovers, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to work on some of these issues for this old Omega. First of all, given the design of this watch, what year do you think it's from? Let me know in the comments. I think it's a really cool looking watch, but it's definitely tied to a specific era. We see that the watch does have a quick set date. But, uh, oh, the crown is coming loose. And uh, the quick set date is something that uh, Omega introduced in the 1000 series of movements. But then the date should quick set when you turn the hands backwards, which uh, doesn't happen in this case. So it might very well be we have a case of the cannon pinion killer. Let's see. So the case is uh, gold plated and it's in very nice condition. No uh, real wear to see anywhere. The crystal is uh, quite scratched, in particular one deep scratch that we'll have to try to get out. Because this is uh, the original crystal and uh, that shape of crystal is not that easy to come by. On the time grapher we see mostly straight lines and uh, that's what we're looking for at this point. Oh, loose. Yeah, loose case back is uh, never a good thing. It is however good to see that the last person who serviced the watch uh, did not scratch their uh, code into the case back but uh, rather used the marker. Quite uh, discolored that rotor but uh, we will clean that off. Omega was pretty early in uh, making these spring-loaded uh, pushers for uh, taking the crown out. So we can use that and then we unscrew the case clamps and we can take the movement out of the case. And the dial is uh, really nice, I must say. Kind of reminds me of an old uh, Les Paul Sunburst guitar. It's kind of a bronze uh, gradient sunburst, very nice. So I line the hands so that uh, we can use the hand levers to take uh, them off easily. Want to make sure we don't press directly on top of the date window, for instance, there. And then we can take uh, the dial off. Now there's a lot of uh, things to say about this movement. Not all good. And yes, this is a movement that uh, a lot of people uh, like to hate. We'll uh, discuss some of the reasons for that. But let's first uh, fix the crown. So the crown came loose, it uh, unscrewed when we tried to uh, move the hands backwards. So uh, that's a simple matter. We we'll just have to uh, basically glue it back on to uh, the stem. It's not uh, glue in the, let's say, normal sense, so it's not super glue. We use uh, something called Loctite, and that's uh, bonding uh, material, if you will. Kind of like glue. Put a little bit too much on, so I'm just uh, dipping that off on uh, the paper. Is dipping a word? Or did I just make a contribution to the dictionary? Anyway. Let's first uh, take off the weekday disc and we right away see the issue. That star on the underneath of the weekday disc is worked on by this uh, star shaped wheel at uh, the 11 date. And this little tiny spring here should press that wheel inwards. And if it doesn't, uh, then you're not going to be able to change the date. So we saw the spring had actually slid underneath that star wheel. And uh, that's something that doesn't just happen. So the watch must have gotten a pretty uh, heavy shock. Probably dropped uh, on the floor, that kind of thing. Or bumped really hard into a door frame, what have you. Anyway, it's uh, actually a great relief to see that that was the issue. Because a common issue with these uh, watches is that uh, the Canon Pinion is so stiff that when you try to change the date, you break the teeth on uh, the quick change uh, lever. And that uh, lever costs a couple of hundred uh, euros or similar nowadays. So 
happy to see that. And there are a few more parts to the Kalina mechanism. Yes, including plastic. Now, I mentioned the cannon pinion before, but uh, this is the actual piece that uh, transfers the power from uh, the train side to the dial side. This is the cannon pinion for the third wheel. And to me, it's a really good example of uh, what I don't like about this movement. Everything is so darn small. Use the third smallest screwdriver, the yellow one, for the bridge screws. I mean, come on. That is just wrong. Still, a lot of people say, uh, bad movement, bad movement. But is it really bad? No, it is not a bad movement. It is a very well-performing, high-grade, well-made movement. Who's a good movement? Who's a good movement? The issue is that um, when the 1000 series was first launched in, uh, I believe it was 1968, then it was uh, Omega's first venture into high beat movements. And high beat movements, so this one is 28,800 beats per hour, they uh, are a bit more finicky in a few ways, mostly related to uh, lubrication. Many will also point out that uh, the design is just not as beautiful as uh, the predecessors. It looks more industrial. It's uh, not got the beautiful curves of uh, the predecessors. And it's really the first family of Omega movements that you can see is uh, designed to a budget. Like that regulator spring. That would just not have passed in earlier movements. But uh, getting back to the main issue of uh, lubrication. So with a higher speed, you basically get more wear. That's kind of what it comes down to. And that all starts with a mainspring. So the mainspring needs to be stronger because you need to impart uh, more impulse to the balance wheel. And that uh, goes through the train, of course. Having a strong mainspring uh, then also uh, exerts more force on uh, the entire train. And a stronger mainspring also requires more force to actually wind with the automatic system. And uh, in the early uh, 1000 series, uh, the main issues were exactly with the automatic system and also with uh, the mainspring itself. Omega decided to uh, make the mainspring self-lubricating. They did that by having a nylon coated uh, slipping bridle inside the barrel, which in itself cost a lot of wear. And the gearing ratios uh, for the rotor and the automatic system was just uh, too aggressive. So uh, all in all, there were some issues. Not crazy bad uh, by any means. But it's also important to remember that Omega was the big dog in the watch industry at this point. An Omega Constellation at this time would be much more costly than a comparative uh, Rolex, for instance. And when you're on top, everyone wants to pull you down. And that is kind of the story. So the 1000 series got a lot of bad press because of this. And uh, even though the 1010 was launched with a very specific message, basically saying that even though this uh, might look like the same movement, it's completely different. The damage was still done. Omega stopped producing their own movements uh, just a decade later and uh, started using ETA movements. But there might be a silver lining, and uh, yes, this is pure speculation from my side, but I do suspect that uh, the loss of reputation uh, that Omega suffered uh, due to uh, the 1000 series could have contributed to them picking up uh, the coaxial movement just a couple of decades later. All right, so while I'm ranting about that, we managed to get all the way to the wigwag pinion, which can be a bit tricky. So using uh, Rolico is fine. And it also has a longer screw than the others that we'll see uh, when we assemble it. The automatic module is uh, quite similar to uh, the one in the predecessors, but uh, the reversal wheel uh, cannot be opened, which means that if uh, it does not work after we've cleaned and lubricated it again, then uh, we're going to have to find a new one. Oh, let's not forget this uh, quick set wheel for the weekday. And let's also not forget the cannon pinion. 
It might look innocent enough, but it also goes by the name of Conan the Destroyer. Take it apart. Well, I'm not completely truthful. It uh, actually goes under the name of Cannon the Destroyer. Because it's uh, responsible for destroying a lot of those star wheels on uh, the quick set date levers. If the cannon pinion does not slip on the friction, then uh, the result is that you will tear off these teeth when you turn the ground. When taking the cannon pinion apart, we need to support the wheel itself so we don't uh, just tear off the whole thing. And uh, using this ground gauge is good for that. Then we use it pin wise and simply take the cannon pinion off. You might have seen uh, quite a lot of dirt coming out uh, when I took some of the wheels out. So we're also going to clean the pivots of the wheels with this uh, super fine abrasive. Does not remove metal, just removes uh, the dirt. The barrel on these watches, uh, given that the movement is only four millimeters thick, it kind of goes without saying that uh, the barrels are also very thin. So I'm using a razor blade to help open it. And I'm indeed being quite cautious here because uh, these uh, shallow uh, barrels it doesn't take much to uh, make the whole mainspring just flip out. The expressway. What we can see, by the way, is that uh, this mainspring has, of course, been uh, changed. We can see this uh, black uh, graphite uh, braking grease. Originally, it would have uh, that uh, dry lubrication uh, nylon bridle. And there we have it. Not that many parts, but uh, enough. So let's get uh, the parts into the cleaning machine. Well, this uh, super small baskets uh, where the most delicate parts go, or maybe rather the smallest parts delicate parts I actually don't put into uh, the cleaning machine. By delicate I mean things uh, made of plastic for instance, um, small springs, the seconds pinion, that kind of thing. The small wheels, they go into the small baskets. And with the baskets filled and stacked we can uh, make the cleaning machine do some work. I'd also like to take this opportunity to uh, thank my YouTube and Patreon members. Thanks so much, everyone. Really appreciate it. If you're curious uh, what members actually get, is that they get uh, early access to videos. They get uh, special members editions of each video. And I'm also producing uh, special projects and uh, let's say tips and tricks videos uh, for the members. Plus, we have a really nice community on the Discord server. So if you want to check it out, then you can click on the join button below, then you will see the options, or you can go to this URL at uh, Patreon. So with the movement in the rice cooker, we can turn our attention to the case. As I mentioned, this crystal is uh, difficult to get, so we're going to take out the big scratch there. And uh, for the case itself, we're going to clean it. We are not going to polish it. The owner doesn't want uh, anything done to the case, and I fully agree. It is in very good condition, and uh, when you polish gold-plated cases, there's always a risk of uh, you going through the gold plating. So that's why you rarely see gold-plated uh, cases being polished. But there is some solid green gunk here. I always wonder what that uh, green color comes from. If anyone knows, then uh, please share in the comment section. All right, we're almost ready for the ultrasonic. Just gonna take a spring out of the case pack. And there we go.
All right, with the sound of the ultrasonic still ringing in our ears, we're going to put uh, some of the parts into the Epilam bath, specifically the shock settings, the escape wheel, and also the Palford jewels. The Epilam is uh, intended to help the lubrication stay in place a little bit better. So it's uh, something that's uh, good to do. Not a must if you do this just for uh, fun or for uh, family and friends, perhaps. But if you're uh, charging money for it, then uh, yes, you should absolutely use uh, Epilam. It does increase the service interval a little bit. That uh, cone and the destroyer uh, photo sort of brought back some memories. That uh, acting masterclass that was uh, Conan the Barbarian it was the first uh, rated H18 movie I ever saw. And I was not quite 18. So I remember uh, borrowing my sister's mascara and sort of uh, coloring the few hairs I had on my upper lip and then tiptoeing past the security guard. Good times. We're putting a little bit of oil in the center of the capstones and then we put the other part of the shock setting, a so-called chaton, which means kitten in French for some reason, or maybe my French isn't good enough, on top of the capstone. And then that little hole in the chaton will sort of suck the oil a little bit so that the stone and the chaton stay together. All right, with the balance uh, working well, uh, we're going to start uh, assembling the rest of the train. going to start with the barrel. And since this is an automatic uh, watch, the mainspring will actually uh, slip along the barrel walls. Yeah, doggy, that's right. That slipping is a built-in safety feature so that uh, when the watch gets uh, wound uh, so much that it uh, has too high tension, then the mainspring will uh, slip a little bit along the barrel wall and that uh, black grease we put in is to uh, break that slipping to make it more uniform and uh, not so violent. That's something we only do for uh, automatic watches. My god man, these stocks are going at it today. Speaking of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, so uh, obviously the man has pretty thick accent but it uh, reminds me of uh, when BMW bought uh, Rolls Royce and then they came out with a new Phantom. Now the Phantom is uh, one of the oldest lines uh, that uh, Rolls Royce has but uh, what was funny was that uh, the German boss then uh, tried to make a joke said well I really hope that uh, you're not going to call this uh, the Phantom and obviously the model was immediately dubbed the Phantom by the British press. So we're putting on this uh, wigwag. I'm using a little bit of Rodico to hold it in place because it's not entirely flush with the underside of uh, this bridge. And then the screw is a little bit longer than the other screws. And that's because the tip has to um, work up against the spring in the main plate. That little spring just right of the barrel there. And then we have to slide the barrel bridge a little bit in so that that uh, tip of the screw indeed works against that spring. And of course we test it. Yeah doggy, we test it. I cannot really determine uh, whether the dogs are encouraging testing like this or uh, protesting it. We are going to oil those little posts for those other two intermediate wheels. And one of them also has this little core. I mentioned uh, some of my gripes with this movement already. 
But uh, another thing is that a lot of the thread sizes are the same. So it's uh, very easy to mix up the screws with this movement. Or maybe that's just me. As mentioned, uh, the screw for the wigwag has a longer tip than the polished tip. While these other screws are uh, just, let's say, normal screws. Another thing that's a little bit uh, awkward with this movement is the seconds pinion. When uh, you press the seconds hand on, there's uh, nothing to hold the seconds pinion from being uh, pushed back. Unless, of course, you put on uh, the bridge for the automatic uh, module, then that bridge will hold it back. The movement is actually designed to uh, put on the rotor first because uh, the rotor uh, post will actually press against the second pinion. But even without the rotor post in that hole, the bridge will still hold uh, the second pinion in place. But uh, pressing on the second sand without the module in place, that will uh, spell disaster. This uh, plastic piece uh, here is the hack, which was also the first uh, time uh, Omega introduced a hack in their movements. It is operated uh, from the other side of the movement uh, by a little post on uh, that uh, same lever for a quick setting the date. So we're going to see that when we turn the movement over. The pivots uh, generally fall very nicely into place with this movement. As uh, I said before, it is a very high grade movement. And um, I'm starting to see more and more of this uh, movement as well. So one might as well get used to servicing it. In the keyless works, there's uh, quite a few uh, spots with uh, very high uh, pressure. So we're going to use this uh, special grease for uh, some of those. Keyless works uh, is also a little bit of a strange construction in this uh, movement. If there is uh, one thing I think they really got wrong, it would be uh, this uh, lever for uh, quick setting the date. It's uh, just way too uh, complex. And as we saw before with that uh, cannon the destroyer clip, that the wheel on the underside of that lever that uh, meshes with the sliding pinion, that one is in particular very prone to breaking off teeth. Another peculiar thing is uh, the strength of these springs here. It's like this spring is strong enough to uh, basically tip a mountain over. And then you have this tiny little screws holding all this stuff together. So it just feels very fragile. It actually isn't. It uh, does work exactly as it should, but it just kind of feels wrong in a sense. Here we have this oft-mentioned date setting lever. You can see it has a little pin right there that goes uh, through the main plate and into that little hole on the hack. So that is how the hack is operated. And this one also has one of these gargantuan uh, springs. Mind you, in relative terms, huh? I mean, these kinds of springs are of course no problems for a trained watchmaker. We are, after all, lifting metal all day, so we are, uh, yeah, if uh, you don't mind us saying so, uh, we, we have a lot of muscle. I'm not sure where I was going with that, but uh, anyway. It's important we lubricate all the pressure and friction points, but it's also important we don't over lubricate. Uh, so that's one place where we can use Rodico to uh, take off any excess lubrication. Now we can put on this tiny little cannon pinion. It's pressed onto the extended pivot of the third wheel. And that means that uh, the power from the train side can now be translated into motion on the dial side. So with the pallet fork uh, also in, we can uh, then uh, put on the ratchet wheel and get ready for lubricating the pallet tools. Let's just make sure we tighten up the ratchet screw a little bit. Then we'll just test uh, that the pallet fork flips from side to side. All right, 
Then we'll lubricate the pallet jewels by putting a tiny little blob of oil or grease in the center of uh, the exit pallet. And we'll see it forms a little uh, deposit at the outside corner, the discharge corner of uh, the pallet stone, and that's uh, just normal. We can also see that uh, the shape of the teeth of uh, the escape uh, wheel on the high bit movement is uh, quite different than those on the lower bit movement. So let's get the balance back in and uh, see if this baby wants to run. Run, baby, run, baby. Yeah, there we go. All right, we're going to lubricate all the drool holes and then we're going to demagnetize the watch and then put it on the time grapher. And that looks fairly all right. We're going to adjust the beat there a little bit and the rate and then see uh, how the amplitude uh, checks out. This uh, movement does have an adjustable uh, stud holder, so it's easy to uh, adjust the beat there. And in the end, uh, yeah, we're going to be okay with this. So let's then rebuild the automatic module. First thing we're going to do there is to lubricate uh, the reverser wheel. We have another of those uh, super expensive hourglass shaped bottles for that. But in this one we have uh, a liquid called Lubetta V105. And that is for uh, reverser wheels. And this lubricant uh, leaves uh, kind of a fatty uh, substance behind that uh, keeps the reverse wheel lubricated. After submerging it, we're going to let it dry under a cup for uh, about 15 minutes. And then we can uh, put the automatic module back together. As mentioned, the design of the automatic module is very similar to uh, the predecessors, but the reverse wheel is uh, locked or closed rather. So we cannot actually open it and uh, clean it if we need to. It'd be also worth noting that this is uh, the US version of the movement with 17 joules instead of 23. And those six joules were then removed from the automatic module. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's uh, simply the tariff system in the US is completely bonkers. So, uh, a lot of companies made the 17 joule versions of movements that uh, normally have more because of the tariff system they're penalizing more joules. So we're putting a little bit of oil also on these uh, pivots and then we can put the automatic module into the movement. And at the center of the movement now you can see this hole I talked about uh, in the automatic uh, module bridge. The second pinion is directly underneath that hole and it sort of butts up against the underside of the automatic module. And when the rotor is on, then the rotor post will further arrest the second pinion. All right, if we then uh, turn the movement over, let's uh, start beginning to put together the date and weekday complications. Remember the cannon pinion. So we're gonna lubricate that one gently then put the cannon pinion onto the wheel. On the dial side, there will be a lot of small posts where wheels uh, are rotating. And then we're gonna put a small amount of oil on those posts. We have a couple of more plastic parts in this watch. And that's uh, the parts we have here for uh, flipping over the date and the weekday. For this movement, the weekday and the date change over at the same time. And uh, the alignment is uh, assured by the little stub 
on the underside of uh, the weekday corrector and then fits into the date corrector. So if you're working on those, make sure you don't just screw uh, those two plastic parts together. They need to uh, really fit together first. Now I talked quite a lot about stuff I don't like, but this uh, double jumper here is uh, actually really cool. It's a double jumper for the weekday and the date. So that's a nice little touch to not have two jumpers. And for those who might not know what a jumper is, this is a little piece of metal that fits in between two teeth of uh, the date disc or the star wheel for uh, the weekday. And this uh, spring held so that when uh, the weekday or the date is almost ready to flip over, instead of just sliding over, the jumper will then force it to snap over or jump over perhaps. Remember this wheel and spring was uh, not properly uh, lined up when we first opened the watch. And that's uh, thus, uh, the wheel that uh, makes sure that uh, the weekday can be a uh, quick set. Here I'm using an oiler to uh, make sure that we flip that jumper a little bit so it rests onto the teeth on the underside of the weekday disc, and then we can screw the disc down. Now for the dial, tell me if you uh, see something that's not right. Yes, the dial is a little bit off center. So to rectify that, I'm using a stake. The hole in the stake is just a little bit uh, wider than the dial feet. And then I just gently bend the dial foot in the right direction. So remember when I first opened the watch and uh, said the reason that uh, the weekday was not changing over was most likely due to a shock. A shock that had uh, displaced the spring. And most likely that uh, same shock has then also made the dial move a little bit. So that's how that happens. All right, we then pull the crown out into time setting mode and uh, rotate until uh, the date flips over. And that should happen at midnight. So that means we can set the hour hand at 12 at that point. We always wanna make sure that uh, the hands do not touch the dial or each other. That's that they are parallel to the dial. And then we'll check the alignment a couple of times. So for a high bit watch like this, one of the more pleasing visual aspects is that uh, the seconds hand moves very smoothly across the dial. So let's uh, slow that down and have a look. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So for every second, the second hand moves eight times. And that's for a 28800 uh, watch. 36,000 uh, beats per hour would of course move 10 times for each second. All right, last big task then is to uh, take out uh, those scratches in the crystal. And given that the top of the crystal is uh, slightly domed, I'm using this uh, softer pad underneath. That helps uh, maintain the shape and also take care of the scratches out on the sides a little bit. To take out the very finest scratches, I then use uh, this uh, poly watch. If you don't have that, then uh, toothpaste is a good alternative. Basically any fine abrasive would do well. Given that the watch has this uh, TV shaped case, we uh, cannot really use the typical crystal press. So uh, 
what I did here was actually to press it in by hand. That is uh, fully possible. But uh, you will need to be as big and strong as a watchmaker. And not many are, eh? I mentioned this before, but the whole reason Arnold Schwarzenegger became a bodybuilder and a movie star is because he was rejected for the watchmaking school. Because watchmakers have to lift metal every single day, all the time, with tweezers. So just imagine how strong you get from that. I mean, he wrote a book called uh, Pumping Iron, or perhaps it was a video. But uh, watchmakers also pump brass and plastic, rubber gaskets. So, yeah. Also good to see that uh, the rotor cleaned up nicely after going through the cleaning machine. And then lastly, let's uh, put in a new gasket. The old one had uh, pretty much uh, disintegrated. And there we are, handsome looking 70s watch. Before seeing the watch on the wrist, I just want to remind everyone that at vintagewatchservices.eu you will always find more than 100 beautiful vintage watches. And as a YouTube subscriber, you can use this coupon code for 10% off. And there we have it on the wrist. I think it's a really cool looking watch. Classic, yet still very 70s. If you enjoyed this video, then uh, why don't you click like and subscribe. Then you will be notified when the next video comes out, which will be quite shortly. Until then... Ta-ta!